All right, guys, welcome back to another Tuesday, Thursday Animal Adventures with Jordan. And today we have a special treat for you on the 4th of July. And that's the unveiling of one of our new animals at the park. And it's this little guy here uh, who is still nameless, but we are looking for a name from Canada or a Canadian name naturally. And it is a Canadian lynx. Now this guy is about nine weeks old. He's been at the facility for just about 10 days, which was a quarantine period to make sure he was happy and healthy. He had a couple of vet checks and things are in order. So today we're ready to release uh, uh, him to the public, obviously for your admiration. So what do you guys think so far? Good? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So many of you know that we have another Canadian lynx on property and her name is Nash. Now this young male was acquired to pair with our girl Nash so they can fall in love and produce further uh, uh, offspring for us. But uh, before we go into that, let's talk about some basics about Canadian lynx. So obviously Canadian lynx live in Canada. Canada and in addition to Canada you can find them in Alaska and other parts of North America now for a conservation status these guys actually have pretty good numbers however state by state here in the United States they're listing them as endangered or threatened excuse me uh, for us to protect them in our native ranges here to make sure that we can uh, continue to have a sustainable population so in New York State these guys fall under our endangered and threatened species permit and uh, we are protecting them the best we can now, in the uh, Canadian ranges in the United States, they live in the forest, the nice, deep, dark, and sometimes frozen forest. And they're very well equipped and adapted to withstand that environment without any issue. Now, first things first, you're going to notice this very thick coat, which they have when they're young all the way through uh, adulthood. And it's a double layered coat, very, very thick, and it protects them from that frozen environment. Now, neatly enough, on your adults, Quite often you try to figure out whether it's a, a lynx or a bobcat and you see that big mane they almost develop. It looks like a gray beard down their, uh, their chins there. In the winter months it gets very thick and it's, uh, it's there to protect their throat and obviously their face. That's one of their neat characteristics. But then also these black tufts up on their ears. Now our little guy, get in there Danielle. Our little guy has little black tufts that have already started, much like a young Tajiri who has his black tufts, our baby giraffe. And as they get older, these tufts increase. And that's another one of those characteristics on the lynx specifically compared to the bobcat. Bobcat, it might have small ones, uh, but uh, nothing compared to the lynx. Now, other characteristics real quick while we're talking about comparing the two uh, is that the lynx is a bigger cat versus a bobcat. Now, a bobcat, uh, it was somewhere around the size of your house cat a little bit bigger. Your Canadian lynx can actually be double in size of your average house cat. Another neat characteristic is their feet. Now our little guy here, he has pretty big feet for a nine week old cub. But if you get down to our girl Nash today, look at her feet, they're absolutely massive. The feet of a lynx can hold twice, up to three to four times as much weight as the feet of a bobcat. All right. So it goes to show they're built to have a little bit bigger body size on them. Another neat characteristic about them is how their front legs are longer than their back legs, which creates a sloping appearance. All right. That's one of the ways people identify them as being uh, as a lynx. Now, quite often, bobcats and Canadian lynx will uh, cross territories, which does create confusion. And of course, the experts are brought in to look at those uh, characteristics to define which is which. Now, talking a little bit more on uh, the body itself, males and females are pretty much the same in appearance, although our males will be a little bit bigger than our females. So when you go down and see our girl Nash today, look at her, add a little bit of poundage, and that's how big our boy will be in due time. Now, as they mature, you're gonna see spotting develop on the coat. You're gonna see um, a lot darker appearances, and of course, that gray beard will start to develop. Now, females, uniquely enough, mature quite young. Females will mature at about 10 months of age. However, they'll kind of wait to breed for another year. So at about two years old, it's really when they're uh, gonna be in their peak or prime to start breeding. Our males, on the other hand, this guy here, he's gonna have a good two to three years possibly before he's ready to actually produce young. Now, neatly enough also is that a male he will mate with many females, as many as he can when it's mating season, where a female will only mate with one male. All right, she will not allow many other suitors, but of course the male bounces around and spreads his seed the best he can because you know what, that's what a dominant male bobcat, or excuse me, lynx wants to do. All right, we're gonna bring this guy down to the ground to play a little bit. Very good. Now our cubs, <laughs> stay quiet. here though, stay here. <laughs> Don't go too far. Now, this little guy, some people might ask, where's his mom? He was with mom. 
Mom raised him right up, and when he weaned out at about six weeks, because they wean relatively early, he then came up to live with us. Now, naturally, a lynx will leave its mom's den at about the week of, excuse me, at the age of five weeks. And at that point in time, mom starts to socialize them, teaches them how to hunt, teaches them how to be a lynx. Well, we've kind of taken over that role based on the environment that he's going to be in here. We want him to, of course, be as natural as possible, but also be human tolerant. We want him to not be afraid of us, and that makes our life a lot easier. Especially when we have to administer veterinary care or anything in pro close proximity, it's better if an animal is comfortable with you instead of afraid of you. Now, I'm going to put this guy down and see where he goes. Where are you headed? Corey, you're on standby. <laughs> you're running. You're running, you're running. He's free. All right, we're coming back, Danielle. <laughs> All right, so other neat things about them, of course, is that body is also adapted to be in that frozen environment I told you about a little bit earlier in the beginning. Now, it can snow quite uh, drastically in some of those spaces, so their feet, again, I said were quite large, and they're actually wet. Now, it's been said that Canadian lynx are actually great swimmers. There's been some that were said to swim the Yukon River without any issue. But in addition to having the web feet that does help them swim, it's really made to help them stand on top of that deep snow. Just like you would wear snowshoes in a snowy environment to stay above that snow surface, that's the purpose that these web feet are serving for them. Now that webbing is of course fully furred to prevent any kind of frostbite or any exposure that is unwanted. Now talking a little bit more about them uh, with what they eat, these guys obviously where they live are gonna enjoy a diet of snowshoe hares. And that can consist of anywhere up to about 90 some on percent of their diet. But in addition to that, they'll take down voles, small birds, and even young, um, <clears throat> young deer and other things like that. If they can get to them, they will consume them if they have to. But ideally, they want to expend as little caloric burn as possible with the items that they consume. So they're saying above, uh, I guess, uh, above the ratio on taking in more than they're expending. That's the name of the game, especially in your cold environments. One more neat thing is about the dental structure. Now these guys have nice big canines. There are four sharp canines and they have nerves that run right through there. Now they can tell, they can feel with those nerves exactly where they're biting their prey item. Often you'll see that with cats and they will adjust their bite to make sure they get on those vital organs or uh, uh, on esophaguses and uh, also the, uh, Dr. Tim, what am I looking for? What's that? Yes, there you go. All right, so the jugular vein. Yes, Dr. Tim is here today. Danielle, scoot, scoot over, wave hi, Dr. Tim. All right, very good. So Dr. Tim literally was just here ch checking on other animals and our little guy as well. So I guess on that note, I'm not gonna keep him out here too much longer. We're gonna let everybody see him real quick and then he'll retire back to the nursery. Now, where's the nursery right now? During the daytime, it's in the office and he hangs out in there with us, destroys everything that he can. And then in the evenings, he returns home. He comes back to my home where he lives with an English bulldog and my family, and we're socializing him. We're letting him take his space, be as much of a cat and explorative animal as he wants to be, but again, being a little bit more tolerant of humans so as he grows older, it'll be easier for us, for him, and for our little girl, Mash. So guys, thank you. We appreciate you coming out today and you guys tune back in on Thursday. We'll have another video clip with another species. What will it be? We don't know just yet. Thanks guys.